in post-war 1950, Chicago was bustling. The city was a thriving industrial hub, its skyline dotted with factories and smoke stacks, while its streets buzzed with life, vehicles, and the rattle of streetcars. Its grid of broad avenues and crisscrossing roads pulsed with movement, as Chicago grew into its reputation as a powerful, gritty urban center. Yet, amid the economic boom and urban expansion, this vibrant city also carried risks, as evidenced on the evening of May 25, 1950, when a single accident transformed an ordinary day into a historical tragedy. This incident, now known as the Green Hornet streetcar crash, would claim 34 lives, injure dozens more, and reshape Chicago's approach to public safety in ways that are still felt today. In the 1950s, Chicago was one of America's largest cities, second only to New York. Its streets were filled with people from diverse backgrounds, drawn by the city's reputation as a place of opportunity. Industry and trade fueled the economy, with factories producing everything from automobiles to textiles. Alongside the heavy manufacturing came a thriving commercial sector, with small businesses, shops, theaters, and bustling markets lining neighborhoods. The city's transit system was the backbone of this movement, facilitating Chicagoans' journeys from work to home, to family, and beyond. The Chicago Transit Authority CTA, managed an extensive network of buses and streetcars, moving residents from the outer neighborhoods to downtown and back again. The streetcars themselves were a common sight, weaving through Chicago's neighborhoods in their green and cream livery, the colors of the iconic Green Hornet fleet. These electric streetcars, introduced to the CTA in the late 1940s, were built to handle the city's growing commuter demands. Each Green Hornet, with its roomy seating and efficient design, carried up to 57 passengers comfortably and was staffed by a driver and conductor. The routes were vital connections, yet unlike today's fixed rails, the streetcar routes could be rerouted by switching tracks, which allowed for more adaptable travel through the urban network. The city's streets were filled not only with streetcars but also with cars, which were quickly becoming symbols of freedom and modernity. In post-war America, car ownership was rising steeply, and Chicagoans embraced the mobility that cars provided. Many of the city's residents aspired to own a vehicle, and the car industry eagerly marketed new models with promises of speed, convenience, and the freedom of the open road. Roadways became crowded, with a mix of streetcars, personal vehicles, buses, and heavy trucks transporting goods in and out of the city's industrial areas. With the growing prevalence of cars came an increase in road congestion, especially in industrial neighborhoods. A lack of clear traffic laws and the limited technology of the day led to frequent accidents, with motorists and pedestrians alike often paying the price for a rapidly evolving traffic landscape. Car racing also became a popular, if often illegal, pastime, with young people modifying cars to race along stretches of road. The roads of Chicago, while vibrant, were also places of inherent danger, the collisions often resulting in injuries or deaths. In response, city officials tried to introduce safety measures, but these measures were limited in scope and not widely enforced. The Chicago Transit Authority was in charge of one of the largest and most complex public transit systems in the United States. CTA buses and streetcars played a vital role in moving people efficiently through the city's dense neighborhoods. However, the Green Hornet streetcars faced challenges. Chicago's mix of narrow and broad streets meant that streetcars had to navigate sharp turns, steep inclines, and busy intersections, often sharing lanes with cars, bicycles, and pedestrians. The streets were cluttered with varied forms of transportation, with few designated lanes or speed limits specific to streetcars. The Green Hornet streetcars were distinct not only for their color but also for their power. Unlike older models, the Green Hornets were electric and could reach speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, making them faster than many other forms of public transit at the time. Despite their sleek design, 
the Green Hornets came with several flaws that would later prove deadly. Their inward opening doors and barred windows, installed to keep passengers safe, ultimately trapped riders during emergencies, as would be tragically evident in the events of May 25, 1950. On May 25, 1950, Chicago experienced a heavy rainstorm that caused flooding throughout the city, particularly at an underpass near the intersection of State and 63rd Streets. This underpass quickly filled with water, creating a significant obstacle for streetcars and other low-riding vehicles. The CTA dispatched city crews to clear the water and divert streetcars away from the underpass, a task expected to take hours. Charles Klein, a CTA employee, was sent to manage the diversion, tasked with manually operating a track switch to redirect streetcars onto a safe route. Klein's responsibility was to signal approaching streetcars to slow down so that he could safely divert them into a turnaround loop. Throughout the day, Klein redirected hundreds of streetcars, with each vehicle slowing down in response to his signals. However, when evening approached, a final streetcar, a Green Hornet carrying a large number of passengers, failed to respond to Klein's frantic gestures. The driver missed the signals entirely, plowing through the switch and barreling straight into a gasoline tanker that had just emerged from the flooded underpass. The impact was instant and devastating. The tanker exploded, creating a fireball that shot through the front windows of the streetcar, immediately igniting the interior. Flames spread rapidly as gasoline pooled around the wreckage. The intensity of the fire left passengers scrambling for a way out. Inside the streetcar, panic gripped the passengers. Many rushed toward the rear doors, where conductor William Liddell, thrown off balance by the collision, managed to regain his footing. Although he managed to unlock the doors briefly, the crush of bodies forced them shut almost immediately. Meanwhile, 14-year-old Beverly Clark, a regular streetcar rider on her way to the movies, remembered an emergency door release she had once used as a prank. That childish prank would prove crucial as Beverly's quick thinking allowed her and a handful of others to escape through the center doors before the flames made them inaccessible. Elsewhere on the streetcar, passengers smashed at windows, some managing to escape through narrow openings only to find themselves trapped again by metal safety bars. These bars, meant to prevent accidents, now acted as deadly barriers, allowing only a few desperate souls to squeeze through to safety. One survivor, 18-year-old Arlene Franzen, managed to escape but watched helplessly as her co-worker struggled and was overtaken by the flames. Emergency responders arrived quickly, but by then, the fire had engulfed the streetcar entirely, making it difficult even to identify the vehicle within the inferno. The fire was so intense that initial responders could do little more than try to contain the flames. Despite the bravery of those who rushed to the scene, the blaze claimed 34 lives, including the driver, and injured another 50. Nearby buildings were also damaged, and the fire rendered over 100 people homeless, adding to the toll of destruction. The Green Hornet streetcar crash was the deadliest public transit accident in Chicago's history, sparking immediate shock and calls for action. City officials and the CTA came under scrutiny, with the public demanding answers about the lack of safety measures that could have prevented or lessened the disaster's impact. The investigation that followed uncovered a series of oversights and issues within the CTA. Charles Klein's actions were questioned, as it was found he had used informal methods, such as plugging the switch, which involved jamming the track switch open rather than manually adjusting it for each streetcar. This practice, while unofficially tolerated, may have contributed to the driver's failure to respond to the signal. The design of the Green Hornet also faced criticism. The inward swinging doors, barred windows, and limited emergency exits hindered escape and increased casualties. Additionally, Chicago's lack of speed restrictions for streetcars highlighted an oversight in transit regulation, as the CTA allowed streetcars to travel faster than was safe on certain routes. The driver of the streetcar had been involved in 10 previous minor accidents, 
yet no formal assessments of his fitness to operate had ever been conducted. Further, the city's regulations on fuel haulage were found lacking. While other cities restricted gasoline deliveries to nighttime hours or capped the allowable gasoline load, Chicago's laws were permissive. The impact of a fuel-laden tanker in such a densely populated area raised questions about the city's commitment to public safety. In response, the CTA made sweeping changes to its transit operations. Speed limits were enforced for all streetcars, and emergency door releases were added to all vehicle exits. Window bars were redesigned for easy removal in emergencies, and streetcar drivers were subjected to routine medical checks. The CTA also increased oversight of flagmen, updating their uniforms for visibility and requiring that proper signaling tools be used at all times. While the reforms addressed immediate safety concerns, they came at a time when Chicago's transit landscape was changing. The 1950s marked the gradual decline of streetcars in favor of motor buses, which were cheaper to operate and more flexible in navigating the city's increasingly congested streets. By 1955, the Green Hornet streetcars had been largely retired, replaced by buses that promised greater efficiency and lower operational costs. In the decades that followed, memories of the Green Hornet streetcar crash faded. The intersection where the disaster occurred went unmarked, blending into the ordinary rhythm of the city. Today, thousands pass through the site of the crash without any sign of the tragic history buried beneath the pavement. Yet, for those who study Chicago's transit history, the Green Hornet crash remains a powerful reminder of the critical importance of transit safety and the human cost of oversight failures. The disaster was more than a singular tragedy, it was a wake-up call for a rapidly modernizing city. As cars, buses, and transit lines continue to evolve, Chicago carries forward the lessons of that night, ensuring that public safety remains a priority. The Green Hornet crash may be largely forgotten, but its legacy lives on in the safer, regulated, and more resilient transit system that Chicagoans rely on today.